started here in the interest of time. Uh, how's everybody doing? Good? End of the semester crunch? Yeah, we, we all feel it. So, um, but to lighten up the load a little bit, we're going to have a, a small get-together at, at my house tonight, 5.30 to 9-ish. We have pulled pork, vegetarian chili, roasted vegetables, cornbread, cheese and crackers. What else do we have, Mike? Beer. <laughs> That's the most important part. We have beer. Anyway, it will give you a chance to uh, to, to uh, talk to our speaker, who is a very dear friend of mine, um, a little bit more in a more informal setting. So please come by 5.30 to 9 and um, bring a friend, bring a whatever. You could even bring a dog. I'm not a big dog. Well, you can bring you can bring Maya. You can bring a Maya, but Maya. That's all right. That's okay. Maya has to get ready for you. That's right. Okay. So, with that, with that invitation out there, uh, is there any other announcements? No. Uh, for those newbies to the University of Connecticut, just a heads up: we don't have class next week. It took me a while to remember that. Thanksgiving week. I didn't realize that the first year I was here. I'm like, oh, we don't have class this week. I was looking, I was waiting for fall break. Yeah, no fall break. So, so you heard it here first. Anyway, we do wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving and safe travels wherever you're going. All right, so it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Timothy Matney. Who is? Were you the first archaeologist I knew? You were definitely the most interesting and fun archaeologist. I knew. And now I know a lot of archaeologists, and they're all fun. But you're the first. All right, I'm getting into trouble already. Um, anyway, I first met him when he joined the faculty at the University of Akron, which was my former institution. And he and his wife Carolyn Berman have been friends for a long time. I even how sad is dog when you otter, the late great otter. Um, so we've been through many adventures together. Some of them actually have been geoarchaeologically related. And so uh, this is how. So he's gotten me all kinds of adventures. One of which was uh, we wrote a NSF proposal to get uh, geophysical equipment to survey uh, archaeological sites. So we did a uh, gradiometer and a resistivity unit. We used to co-teach a class on geoarchaeology, geophysical methods in archaeology. And then, um, can I tell them about Jason West? Sure. So one day I was seeing my office in Akron real quickly, and the sheriff called and said, can you find dead bodies, or no, bones and dirt? And I, as a paleontologist, said, of course I could find bones and dirt. He meant dead bodies and dirt, like human beings. <laughs> and so I quickly called Tim. I'm like, um, Sheriff just called. And I don't know if that was the impetus for all of what you've been doing lately. But we did have, we did actually go out and survey a so-called crime scene with the uh, suspect was in an orange jumpsuit and flip-flops, I remember. <laughs> and shackles. And shackles. That scared me a little bit. Um, and he was pointing to where he buried these bodies, but we couldn't find them with our gradiometer and resistivity units. Did a lot of digging, test pits, and so forth. Um, what I think Tim's going to talk about today might get him closer to that capability. So he, he actually was born and raised in Kansas. Yep. He has a twin. Um, he went to the University of uh, London, actually, to, for his undergrad, and then he went to the University of Pennsylvania for his graduate degree. He's authored 90 papers, books, and including his latest book. This is a book on his his big dig, his his, his other life as a as a excavation archaeologist um, in the old world and southeastern Turkey. So he was responsible for this one, Ziaret Tepi, and also co-authored um, 
co-lead on the uh, Teachers Holyoke uh, um, explanation. So these volumes, there'll be volumes and volumes of information coming from these once he hits his sabbatical. But this is a really nice, popular book. It's beautiful. And it's going to be, is it released? It must it's be. available on Amazon. Ooh. Yeah, well, on Amazon. <clears throat> And there'll be a big launch in London next Christmas. Next, it is next the ultimate month. Christmas present. <laughs> so I talked too long, but I just wanted to welcome my dear friend and colleague Timothy Matney today. Thank you, Lisa. Well, I can vouch for the fact that dinner smells great, so you should come to the house. They've been working on it last night, and really, it's going to be quite the feast. Um, Thank you, Lisa. That was a great introduction. I'm not sure anyone has ever told, been told that I'm a twin before in an introduction. So we <laughs> really do even know each other. Um, yeah, um, what I want to talk to you about today is, is really work in progress. Um, my work is primarily as a field archaeologist in the Near East. I've worked in Turkey, I've worked in Syria, I've worked in Iraq, um, I've worked in Israel. And all of this has been pretty standard archaeological material. Uh, it's been excavations, it's been surface surveys, it's been geophysical surveys. Um, and the project that I'm going to talk about today is sort of a side project that has developed out of that, um, and which I'm hoping someday I'll be able to take to Near East, but that's probably 10 years down the road. Um, as Lisa said, I've taught some uh, applied geophysics and a little bit of that will creep into the beginning of the talk, and then we're going to go into a new field or new area for me, which is geochemistry. Um, I have to tell you up front, I am not a <laughs> physicist or a chemist, um, and so one of the things I'm going to do is introduce you to my field team that has allowed us to, to work together in what is a really, truly interdisciplinary uh, kind of project. So this is, for the archaeologists in the room, a radical new approach to looking at our sites. Um, we're going to adapt some existing technologies uh, to some very specific types of questions. So you're not going to get a definitive answer, I'm afraid, to anything. So just for those of you who are not trained as, as archaeologists, uh, we routinely use now uh, geophysical survey techniques in archaeology to map subsurface remains. Uh, there are dozens of techniques that are used. Uh, the two that are illustrated here on the <clears throat> on the board are probably the most common in use. And I was telling Alexia Lucas uh, before uh, this talk that when I gave my first paper in Turkey at the annual symposium in 1994, out of the three or four hundred papers, there were two that mentioned geophysics. Uh, when I gave my last paper there in 2014, about two-thirds of the projects mentioned some form of geophysics. So it has gone from a very <coughs> specialized almost seat of the pants kind of technology for archaeologists to very standard. In fact, we teach it, as Lisa said, to undergraduates in Akron. Uh, so, uh, electrical resistance survey, as you'll probably all know, you create a subsurface uh, electrical field and measure uh, immediately subsurface or shallow subsurface um, fluctuations in the passage of the electrical current below ground in order for us to map archaeological features. Magnetic field gradiometry, same basic idea. In both cases, we're collecting grids of data, walking transects and collecting uh, samples at a uh, given interval. Uh, magnetic field gradiometry, we're measuring uh, changes in the Earth's magnetic field, strength and direction, uh, again, caused mostly by immediate subsurface features. So we're really only interested in the top one or two meters uh, of the uh, subsurface. There's a long, long literature uh, on this, on these technologies, and the basic idea of, of taking readings, converting the ohms uh, or the nanoteslas to a pixel value, and then printing out a map now is, is pretty obvious. In archaeology, the reason why this has been such a major growth field, one of the reason why it's so important, uh, is that geophysics gives us a number of advantages over excavation. And I've listed a few of them up here on the screen. Um, the area that we can cover is much larger using geophysics than excavation. Uh, for those of you who have, who have been excavating before, uh, a dig the size of this room would take us an entire field season, or maybe two, or maybe three. 
um, especially if we're digging down on <coughs> Mars. Um, in geophysics, you could map this area in part of, of the morning. So it's much faster, different type of information, uh, but it is uh, quicker and less expensive uh, than doing excavation. So archaeologists primarily use geophysics subsurface uh, uh, mapping in order to figure out the best places to conduct additional research, often excavation. Um, Geophysics is minimally intrusive, whereas excavation actually destroys the context as it's being recorded. Uh, someone once famously said, archaeologists are the only scientists who kill their informants as they're interviewing them. Um, if you've excavated a, a deposit, you can't go back and, and excavate it again. Um, under good conditions, and I'll show you an example of a good condition, we can actually map out a, a, with a fair degree of precision a fairly large area. Um, however, and we're really going to focus on this, this third drawback to geophysics, uh, there are some serious limitations. Uh, the techniques that we use, in general, don't tell us anything about the function of the features that we're looking at unless we happen to know them based on the context. Um, they don't tell us the date, and I'll give you a very short example which is instructive. Um, and in many cases, depending on which technologies you're using, you can't get the depth. Now, if you're using ground-penetrating radar, you can calculate the depth. Uh, but in the most, for the most part, all we're getting is a two-dimensional plan of anomalies caused by subsurface features, whether those are pits or walls, field systems, um, kilns, uh, things that archaeologists would typically find uh, through, their, through their excavation. So, we're going to focus today on the, the last of these drawbacks. Um, having spent the last 24 years uh, in Turkey, this is the only slide I'm going to show you from Turkey. Um, this is a uh, electrical resistance survey that we conducted over two field seasons at Ziret, uh, Tepe in Turkey, uh, back in 2004-2005. You get a sense of the scale here. 20 meters, so this is a fairly large area. Um, measurements are in ohms with the white representing low resistance. Um, and what you're looking at is the plan, or the partial plan, of an Assyrian city. On the surface, you can't see anything. There are no surface features um, at all, other than there's a lot of pot shirts, but there are no actual features themselves. Um, this is agricultural land. It's been plowed for a couple thousand years since the Assyrians were there. And what you can see very clearly, even without a lot of training, is a nice long linear feature here, which is the city wall. You can see external gates or external towers. You can see a gateway with an entrance in, two little chambers, and then this is the structure of the defensive uh, gateway leading into the city. And you can see the nice linear features which represent rooms in buildings across here. We've excavated a number of these uh, for ground truthing purposes. So this tells us an awful lot about what's down below the surface. And in fact, we chose to excavate in this area because of the geophysics. That's its general use within, within archaeology. Now, what we can't learn from geophysics is what were they doing in this room? What's the nature of the deposit? What are the soils like? Other than the fact that there's a contrast between the uh, mud brick walls here, which have a low resistance uh, because they main, uh, uh, maintain moisture slightly better, and this internal area, which is clearly uh, higher resistance in this case because of the uh, nature of the floor itself. We excavated this, and it's a, it's a mosaic floor. This, I always, when I, we first did this, uh, made this map, I assumed that this was a well, area of low resistance, highly compacted surface around it. Um, makes sense, you would bring your, you know, I even had a scenario where you brought your flocks in and the, the animals are here and then they would go over here and they would drink at the well. And, well, as it turns out, and I won't give you the entire painful story because it's really long and painful. That's a, that is a 2003 threshing floor where someone drove a tractor in a circle threshing wheat for several days. And we found that out after we excavated when we returned the next year, and they were threshing wheat in that exact spot. Mm -hmm. So that is modern. These are ancient. Geophysics doesn't necessarily tell us the date, and that's the lesson to be learned. So 
Um, one of the Kim. Yes. One quick question. Yeah. What's the Nazis oriented uh, strips? You, you see a lot of Nazis. These? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's You're actually on that part. You know, yeah. um, some of them are plow, 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 plow lines. Plow. Okay. That's, that's actually the track of our Land Rover, okay. driving back and forth over the, the course of the <laughs> of the field season. So, um, again, you have to be very careful in interpreting these and understanding that you don't know what the dates necessarily are. Um, just like with most geophysics, what we did was we, uh, when we found anomalies, we would excavate at least one example of them for ground truth. So, in the fall of 2010, um, I was at the ASOR meeting, which is the meeting that I'm going to in Boston soon, and I was having a, a drink with uh, Lou Summers, who's pictured here holding a uh, magnetic radiometer, and uh, Lou is an optical physicist who's done a lot of geological or archaeological geophysics, and he's kind of a mad scientist fellow. Is that a fair assessment, Lisa? Fair assessment. Okay. And Lou said, I have this idea. Wouldn't it be useful if we could characterize what's below the surface inside your features using chemistry? In other words, if we had a probe system which could take spectra that we could then turn into a chemical characterization of the soil below the surface, we could, in a sense, improve the picture that you're getting through the geophysical surveys. Um, he even had, he started drawing me a diagram. I think it was probably not on a napkin, but it could have been on a napkin, it's not a piece of paper. So this idea that he'd been playing with, um, that we could get it, construction details, function, use. And his initial suggestion to me was, oh, we could find like an area where they were making soap. Which I have to admit, and I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed, I, was, I thought that was a really bad example. That's just, mm -hmm. I sort of poo-pooed the whole thing. But we'll get back to living his soap. So, uh, Soil, of course, soil chemistry has been used in archaeology for decades. And usually that would involve excavating down to a surface and then taking soil samples from a known surface, um, sending it off to a lab or using little test strips in the field in order to determine things like phosphates. And that was being done back in the 70s and the 80s, but always as part of excavation. And what Lou had envisioned was a Survey equipment, was survey equipment that would be non-intrusive or minimally intrusive using uh, a probe system. So we left the meeting and in the uh, spring of 2011, I was having a drink with another colleague, David Perry, at the, uh, the um, a meeting, it was a soiree that our Office of uh, Research Services puts on at the university. And I was explaining this problem or this project to, to David and just because he's an optical, he's a spectroscopist, and I said, do you think this would work? And David, who's also kind of a mad scientist in a way, said, yeah, I think we can do that, and he signed up. And so we started to form a team. I uh, grabbed uh, Linda Barrett, who is a soil scientist who also worked with, with Lisa and I, and we started exploring the literature and trying to figure out if we could actually put this equipment together. So the big picture was, in situ, minimally intrusive, fast subsurface chemistry mapped in real time. So we took this idea to the NSF uh, and uh, to the creative program and suggested that we would like some money to go out and give this a try. And they said, no, it's too experimental, it's too difficult to assess because it crosses too many boundaries, the chances of failure are too high, we just don't have enough money for it. So we continued to push on. And uh, we actually, you know, we were doing a lot of background research. And the big problem was we didn't have the equipment. Lou had this idea of what the machine should look like, but we didn't have any money to build it. Um, and at some point in the early part of the uh, uh, summer, uh, we realized, I think actually it was David who found this, uh, that the equipment that we were looking for already existed, but in a place we would never have thought to look at first, which was industrial agriculture. So here's the, the system that Lewin envisioned and drawn out on a piece of paper, already in use. Uh, and we made a, a, a partnership with Veris Technologies, this is Chase Maxton, who works at Veris. And he has the rig that you're looking at here, which is the Veris P4000, um, which has a probe 
has spectrometers that go into the ground. Perfect. Now all we need is an archaeological site. So uh, we recruited a couple of uh, experts in uh, the archaeology of Kansas and decided to give it a try at an archaeological site. Uh, we got permission from the Kansas State Historic Preservation Office to go to a couple of historic sites um, and do, do some tests. Now, why Kansas? We went to Kansas because Varus is in Kansas and Salina, and moving the equipment is really expensive, so it was easier and cheaper and more effective to move us to the machine. And in any case, this was a total experiment. Could we see anything at an archaeological site? So here is the, the rig. It has a one and a half meter long probe. It's got a small sapphire window at the bottom. Um, it's connected by fiber optics to two spectrometers. Uh, the hydraulics probe push the probe into the ground. Here you can see a, a detail of what the probe window looks like. Um, the time and rate of insertion gives us a depth measurement. Uh, this machine will measure insertion pressure uh, in order to provide a measure of the density and hardness of the soil. Uh, the spectra here are recorded in the uh, visible and near-infrared spectra with the sort of standard P4000 setup. Um, after each probe, the window is cleaned, but this is cleaned in the agricultural sense of the word. Uh, they're taking one sample per hectare because what they're trying to figure out is the current, uh, the current content of nitrogen and carbon and other elements in the soil so they know where to dump fertilizer. So they don't need very close spacing, they need a general picture. Um, there's a calibration uh, procedure, which I'll talk more about, and the uh, raw data are captured, captured on an onboard computer. So essentially, all of the elements that we needed for testing the site were already here. We just needed to scale down the, uh, the sampling to something that is appropriate to archaeology. So, for those of you who are uh, interested in spectroscopy or have uh, some detailed knowledge, uh, this is the information on the from the Varus uh, machine on the Varus machine from their uh, websites. Uh, roughly a meter uh, is our maximum depth. We go a little bit more than that with an insertion speed of about two centimeters per second. So this is a slow process. Spectra are collected at a rate of 20 per second. They're averaged to provide uh, spectral absorbance information at roughly five centimeter depth intervals. Uh, each spectra contains 400 um, separate wavelength measurements. And Lisa, when you were asking me earlier about were you collecting, you know, was there a lot of data points? And the answer is, yeah, we have a lot of data from this uh, from this machine. So we're roughly going uh, from, in our case, 350 to 2,000, 250 nanometers. So, we went to a couple of sites in Kansas uh, using this equipment, and I'm going to really focus just on one to make it easier and also to try and keep somewhere vaguely within the time frame. Uh, this is the Pawnee Indian Village, also known as the Kansas Monument Site um, in Republic, Kansas. And what you can see here from this aerial photograph are circular structures, and those are subsurface um, features. Those are all these large lodge houses one of which is, sits directly under this museum, so you can go and see one that was in excavation. Uh, this is the only part of the site that wasn't plowed subsequent to its occupation uh, in the late 1800s, so everything else from the site is gone except for this one small patch where archaeologists have been working. So here we had a site that we knew. It had been excavated, so we knew what the answer key was when we went to uh, do some uh, spectroscopy there. It's occupied between 1770 and 1802, so the early 1800s. Um, and you can see a number of roundhouses in the imagery. Uh, now, as I said, these have been excavated not by us, but earlier. Uh, this is a dig from the 60s. So for those of you who are not archaeologists, this is the mud floor, which was the surface uh, of one of these houses. These are the post holes that would have held a superstructure of wood and thatch. Uh, this is the entrance into the building, and in the center, right behind this person, uh, who is holding a shovel and not doing anything with it, so it's obviously a staged photo, uh, there is a heart right back, right back there. And you can see another one in the, uh, the picture there. And here's an artist's reconstruction. If you ever happen to be wandering across northern Kansas, stop in a republic and take a look at the museum they've set up. It's quite a nice one. It gives you a real sense of what these 
these places were like. So the houses are represented by shallow depressions over which the substantial superstructure of wood and thatch was built. Now, the houses are quite large. They're obviously housing uh, dozens of people in one space. So what we did with the Barris machine was we, um, first of all, mapped them using uh, both electrical resistance and uh, magnetic radiometry. And then we simply took a transect across one of the houses in order to see uh, what the P4000 probe would give us in terms of the features such as the outside walls and we of course went across the hearth in this particular case. Now this is one of the houses that they excavated and I'll show you how we managed to survey a place that they already excavated because they didn't dig the whole thing. And one of the things that they said they had problems with was they actually, even though they knew where they were, they had trouble archaeologically finding the outside of the house in this particular case. So here's the pattern of, uh, of the probes, um, or of the probes. We're put, taking probes every meter until we get close to the hearth, and it's every half meter. They excavated this, and they excavated this piece, so we could actually just run right along the bulk <coughs> in the unexcavated portions, and we knew exactly what was going to be found because we had the answer key sitting a few centimeters from us. Now, You'll notice that we've also marked in cores, because in addition to taking the probes, we were also taking core samples. And the core samples are used uh, for create, which we then uh, send off for chemical analysis. And they create, um, essentially, again, it creates a known reference points from which we can uh, conduct chemometric analysis in order to map out uh, the concentrations of um, various chemicals across the site. So here's the, turning first to the cores, uh, this is what the cores look like. Um, this is one of the cores from the Republic site. Uh, what we did with them was we cut them into 10 centimeter segments unless they were otherwise showing a natural break in stratigraphy. We then homogenized those and uh, we both sent them off for chemical analysis and we also ran them on the the spectrometer. We sent them to Kansas and had them run on the spectrometer. So uh, we then have, if you will, two data sets. So one set comprised the spectral measurements, which in my abstract design here are the red lines, and the other set are the more specific chemical measurements from the cores at select vertical shafts, and those are the blue ones, the blue rectangles in our, in our uh, transect. The Chemical analyses gave us determinations of a number of different analytes, including organic matter, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, sodium, magnesium, etc. So at select locations on the, across the transcript, uh, transect, we had both spectral data and chemical data. So at each of these points, we have both. And then we have intervening between those, the probe data, the spectra that were taken uh, via the probe. So, uh, the, chem the chemometric analysis that we're doing, the goal is uh, to find the connections between the two data sets, between the spectral and the chemical uh, information that we can then use to build a reasonably acceptable model, uh, which is then applied to the rest of the grid. In other words, we're filling in the spaces and working from the known, which is the chemical assessments of the cores, uh, to the unknown. So using this uh, analytical technique, uh, these are some of the results from our very first attempt at using the P4000 uh, in Kansas. Uh, so here's our, our, our hearth, or sorry, our house, hearth in the center, exterior walls. If you follow these dotted lines, these three dotted lines move out and become those three dotted lines there. And so you can see that in some cases, uh, there's a very clear change in the concentration of various uh, uh, chemical components uh, relative to known archaeological features. So the hearth in the center, for example, we can see changes in phosphorus in organic matter um, and also in calcium. Um, as I said before, one of the problems the archaeologists had was physically seeing the difference in the soil conditions at the edges of the house itself, so along these two exterior <coughs> lines. And one of the things you can see here is the organic matter concentrations are higher 
for both of the edges. Um, and we can also see similar sorts of changes um, in the, the calcium scale here. So this was an attempt to just see if we could see anything at all. And um, we felt that this was success that had worked, that we showed something. Obviously, this is one example out of the entire data set. So in December of 2012, we applied to the archaeometry program at NSF using an unpublished version of the uh, results from that test um, and asked for money to buy the equipment so that we could continue to, to work with it. And it, this was rejected because it was too expensive and it was still too risky and our proof of concept wasn't published. So we published the results of the first test in the Journal of Archaeological Science. Um, and in November, we requested money from uh, the Department of the Interior's National Center for Preservation Technology and Training, NCPTT, for a second round of traditional work in Kansas. Uh, and that was funded, and we've done the field work, and I'll show you some results from that. At the same time, we thought maybe so much of this work that we're doing is, it's about the science, but also you have to be able to sell the science to the funders. You have to be able to get the resources you need. So we thought maybe we're thinking of this in the wrong way. What we've been doing is trying to find a machine or technique for generally studying archaeology. Maybe we needed to focus on a specific problem. And we'll come back to that in chapter five of this story. The, the specific uh, problem takes us back to Lisa and the, the hand, because we're going to look for dead bodies. So, and no, we didn't find the, the serial killers victims, mm -hmm. but never, never give up hope. So we wanted to do three things with the NCPTT project. We wanted to collect data in a grid, not just a transect, so that we could try and model features in 3D. We wanted to collect more empirical data on different types of features and at different sites. And we wanted to test the effect of different sampling densities. So we uh, planned five solid days, and this is what we do on our spring break. We went back to Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> so back at the Republic site, we also went to two other sites in, uh, in Kansas, the Tobias East and Tobias West site. And at each of these sites, what we decided to do uh, was to change the sampling density uh, in our, and collect it in a grid pattern to see what difference that made in terms of the resolution of archaeological features using uh, the technology. Um, at the Republic site, we used the, the, the um, densest sampling density, 16 samples per meter, so 25 centimeter sample intervals, 25 centimeter transect intervals uh, over a 4 by 4 meter area. Now, this is a tiny area. Think of it. <coughs> four meters by four meters in us in this room. And it took us one entire day with a machine running for about 11 hours to collect all of the data that we needed because you have to move the machine around and it's on that enormous truck. So rather than focusing on the, house, the uh, houses which we had already worked on, uh, we decided instead to focus on the intervening space between them and what they're calling the plaza areas. And previous archaeological work had shown that at these sites, in addition to living in these lovely, big, spacious, round houses, uh, people had these very large, deep storage pits, or sort of bell-shaped pits with a small top and a big bottom. Um, and the, those were used for storage until they fell out of use, and then they were filled with trash. And you can see them in, indicated here uh, by the circles. So some of them had been excavated. Others had been discovered, but not excavated. Um, the red box here represents an area of uh, where we're going to do some resistance work. And here's uh, one of the resistance surveys in that red box. So here's our, our house circles again, very obvious and easy to see. And these black dots represent uh, the location of what we think we thought were going to be these bell-shaped pits. So we're going to focus in on this pit here, and we're going to collect a 4 by 4 meter grid over that and see if we can model it using this technology. So here's uh, one of the pits uh, that was excavated by a previous group. Archaeologists often dig their pits by digging half the pit, drawing this section, and digging the other half of the pit. And this is roughly what they look like. And you can see here they've used probes 
soil core probes, and they're trying to correlate the edges of the pit with different colors of soil. This is pretty common, but there's no, they're not doing any chemical assessment of this. All they're doing is looking at soil colors, which of course we can do with our equipment as well. Um, I'll point out that there's someone in the pit, so you get a sense of how big these things are. They're very deep, uh, very large uh, storage pits. <coughs> so, uh, here is uh, some of the results from our 4x4 four four meter grid. Um, the sample density, again, was 289 points every 25 centimeters, um, continuously timed spectra. We ended up with about 5,780 average spectra across these 16 uh, square meters. So, with apologies to spatially, to, to, to spatial true, true uh, nature, this is, those two arrows are representing this area right here, so it's sort of turned on its side. Here's our pit, or what we thought was going to be the pit. Um, these two points here represent roughly what we uh, thought were the edges of the pit based on the resistance data. And here is the uh, result of a transect of data, this transect mapped out in the way that we had showed you before. This is uh, the uh, absorbance at 600 nanometers across this particular line. And you can see at this edge of the pit is this line right here. We can see a very clear change in the color of the soil uh, at 600 nanometers corresponding to the edge of the pit between outside and inside. Here, we, it's much less distinct uh, where the edge of the pit is, but you can still get some sense of it in if we, as we model it in diff with different colors and uh, different um, uh, resolutions. Uh, it comes out a little bit better. But that's just one line. That's just a transect. Um, as I said, we can also measure insertion pressure. And here, again, you can see very clearly it's right about here, the edge of the pit and the interior of the pit. Uh, is less dense and softer, as one would expect. Uh, so this fits very much with our understanding of what we would probably look like, uh, look for in a, uh, in a pit. So we take a whole series of transects, we stick them together and we slice them horizontally, and we come up with a depth slice uh, for this pit. And here again, I'm just using the example from 600 nanometers out of all of the hundreds of these graphs just as an illustration. And here you can see right here uh, the changes that we had seen before as a, uh, a feature of depth is now in plan view. And we can start to see how our features correspond to one another um, looking across this uh, four by four meter area. Now, this isn't very exciting to look at as a graphic. I understand that. For us, this was really exciting because it was showing us that, again, uh, we were making progress towards what we want ultimately to be high-resolution modeling. <clears throat> one could take a whole series of these depth slices and look at them stacked one on top of the other. Uh, this is actually the depth slices from the Tobias East site. What you're looking at is concentration of sodium at 2.5 centimeters, 7.5 centimeters, 12.5 centimeters, 17 and a half, 22 and a half, 27, et cetera. And we would stack 20 of these on top of one another. And you can see emerging, starting really here, but certainly here, that there is a feature in the south, because this is, again, stacked one on top of the other. There is a high concentration of sodium at this particular point now. I can't tell you what that means precisely at this point, but the fact that we're able to map it uh, is in itself uh, going to be pretty important. So. The obvious next step is to take these stacked depth slices and simply turn them into a three-dimensional model. And this is our very first crude attempts at doing this. Um, when, <clears throat> when we were talking at the beginning of the Kansas project, Dave Perry called up a picture of a medical PET scan or CAT scan. And he was rotating it on his computer and you could see all the details of the interior workings of the body on this map. And he said, this is what we need for the subsurface. Well, <laughs> this is where we are. I wouldn't want to do any surgery based on this. But um, you can clearly see, uh, in this case we're back to our 600 nanometers, you can clearly see the distribution of these points uh, giving us a, uh, a picture which corresponds 
to the location of, of the pit itself. Uh, so again, in correlation with what we expected to find. So we're really only at the very, very beginning, and I said this was a work in progress of this, of this project. So, as I said, when we applied for that NCPTT grant, uh, we were also uh, thinking that we needed to figure out a more specific target, and I suggested let's look for human burial products. Let's look at for the, the soil chemistry of decaying humans, which presumably must have left some trace uh, in, the, in the soil itself. So while we're waiting here on the NCPTT grant, we also uh, started doing some research into uh, forensic anthropology and into what sorts of chemical products we might expect to find in the ground. Uh, we recruited uh, Dr. Giovanna Vidoli from the University of Tennessee's Forensic Anthropology Center, lovingly known as the Body Farm, and uh, David Lacotte, who is a criminal justice folk for us, because we wanted to apply to the National Institutes of Justice for a grant uh, to develop equipment, and what we're telling them is the equipment will be able to find buried bodies, which is obviously of interest to the police, uh, the military, the FBI. There's a lot of possible uses for it. Same basic technology, we're just picking out a single, single, um, uh, a single target. And of course, this was immediately rejected because it rejected because it was too experimental, too costly, and there was a high chance that it wouldn't work. No proof of concept. Um, forensic work is employs a lot of the same technologies that the uh, archaeologists use. The biggest difference is they use cadaver dogs for finding uh, uh, buried bodies. I've worked with a number of cadaver dogs, and it's an interesting process, although it's not uh, nearly as successful as one would hope. And so we were hoping to be able to improve upon uh, the cadaver dogs and the use of, of current technology in, in forensics. But the fundamental problem is we can't get to a buried body. We can't move our equipment to a, to, a, to a graveyard and just start probing in Kansas, and we can't get bodies sent to us, which is why we had suggested we wanted to go to the body firm where we could set up a uh, test a test pit with bodies that had been donated to science. So we thought there are two possible solutions to this problem. First solution is, well, let's not use people, let's use pigs, because we all know that pigs and people are pretty closely related. Um, pig simulations are very common in forensic, anth in forensic uh, work as sort of training mechanisms. Um, so we we're going to target, target as a chemical of uh, the saturated fatty, fatty acids that form during the decomposition of bodies. Um, this is the famous case of the soap lady, and Lou was right, yes, soap was what ultimately I was going to be interested in, and I just didn't know it. Um, after her burial, we know that the white waxy substance called adipocere <coughs> uh, survives sometimes for centuries uh, in bodies under the right conditions, especially when it is alkaline, warm, and airless. And so our idea was <coughs> possibly this adipose here would pr be preserved in soil, even at very minute um, concentrations, and that we should be able to see it uh, using our equipment. So the University of Akron in 2011 had set up a pig dig, which is a mock crime scene. It was really popular with the students, although it was very gross, um, where they created, they dressed up pigs, they had alibis, they had murder weapons. I think once involved guns, once involved a vehicle. Anyway, they would bury these, let them rot for uh, about a year or so, and then the students would go and learn how to find, excavate, record, and analyze crime scenes. I had been allowed to take a series of core samples um, next to this, this pig prior to excavation, and you can see the location of the samples. And this core C2 is going to be important. So. We just happen to have a dead uh, a series of soil cores taken next to a burial that just wasn't human, but it was as close as we were going to get. And here, I put this in for Lisa, so me and John Zabo collecting up the soil samples at the big dig prior to, to the excavation. So one of our graduate students uh, set up an experiment for a master's paper which involved taking a bunch of soil samples of different types of soils, sandy soil, clay soil, um, 
and um, silty soil, spiking it with various uh, chemicals which we assumed would be good proxies for the uh, decay of human bodies, and you can see them listed here, um, at a known uh, concentration. So she did 8%, 4%, 1%, all the way down to 0.01% of leucine, calcium, uh, pyrophosphate, oleic, and palmitic acid. Um, and uh, again, this was our best estimate of what the uh, decay products might be in the, in the soil. So here she is uh, running mid-infrared spectra uh, using uh, equipment that we had in Dave Perry's lab. He had an uh, uh, ATR uh, FT spectrometer. And all four of the decay products were detectable using this technology in soil. Um, some of the limits were as low as, as it says on the screen, 0.01% uh, for oleic and palmitic acid. So in theory, we should be able to see something uh, from the soil samples from the pig dig if the fatty acids were present. So here are the spectra from uh, one of the samples of palmitic acid. Um, there are four peaks, two, prim uh, two primary peaks and two secondary peaks. Um, and as you can see, as the concentration in the soil sample uh, decreases from 8% to 4% to 1%, down to 0.01%, uh, this peak becomes less and less distinct. And the point at which we can no longer detect a peak, we've reached our limit, the limit of detectability. And that was really the point of Sarah's uh, experiment was to see if this was possible and what those limits uh, would be under ideal conditions. These are controlled conditions in which we're taking known soil samples and known concentrations of chemicals. Having established this, she's, she then goes back to the pig cores and uh, we see, and to see if she can see any uh, similar uh, spectra coming out of the cores. Now this is Core C2, the one that's not the closest, but the next to the next to that uh, uh, relative to the pig. Here's the uh, this is the uh, spectra I showed you earlier. So that's the, the test example, and this is the results from the spectra taken on this particular core, and it's the red line which is down here is from zero to ten centimeters, and I apologize, that's the top, that's the bottom. I've, it's flipped over. Um, but as you can see, at 0 to 10, there is no discernible peaks. But from 10 to 20, it's this blue line with the same characteristic peaks as we see in the test sample. So um, this suggests to us that uh, we, in fact, are able to see uh, fatty acids in soil after a year from a pig. So we applied to NIJ again, and they said, no, you're only using pigs, you need to use humans. <laughs> we're back to stage one. This is not meant to discourage you from going to graduate school and completing your degree in five things. <laughs> it's just the way that these, these sorts of projects work. So uh, we're only at the very beginning of, of what I'm considering chapter five in this. Second solution, if using pigs wasn't the best solution, was to take soil cores taken from human burials and test them on the bench equipment that we have, both the uh, mid-infrared and the various equipment. Um, the problem was getting the soil cores, and by sheer, I can't call it luck, because it's really too, too grim. There was a very unfortunate event um, in a state which cannot be named, uh, where the Department of Transportation actually plowed through a Native American burials Native American cemetery burial ground that they should have known was there because the locals knew it was there. Uh, they didn't do their due diligence and bodies started coming out of the ground and you can just imagine the public relations nightmare that this created. And so the Department of Transportation immediately hired an archaeological firm and one of the subcontractors to that was Dave Mackey who works with us and Dave contacted the tribe and said it would be really useful if we could get soil samples from around those burials to see if there was uh, any uh, trace of the fatty acids that we suspect would be available or would be present. And if we had that and it worked, we could then bring the equipment out to, to the uh, field site and we could actually test to see if we can find the edges of the cemetery. Because of course this is not a marked burial ground, this is just 
a general area that they needed to know what it was. And the tribes, to our surprise, said, okay, as long as we get all the soil back so we can rebury it. So we have acquired, as of September, uh, 185 soil samples from a disturbed Native American burial ground. We know that it's approximately 200 years old. And um, we have the samples in the lab, and we've been running the mid-infrared spectra on it. We've sent them to Kansas for the various uh, spectra, and those aren't back. And on Friday before I came, I got a call at 8.30 in the morning from Dave Perry, the chemist, who was very excited. He said, the graduate student, Lopa Afrin, uh, just told me that she was able, that, she, that the first results that were positive came back from one of the soil samples. So they'd run 100 or so, and they'd seen nothing. And then all of a sudden, those characteristic peaks came out. And so it looks like we may be able to, and I says, this is so tentative, I shouldn't say it, or I should at least maybe turn the, 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 the video recorder off, because it may turn out to be totally wrong. But the preliminary assessment is that we actually are able to see the human decay products using uh, the technology that we've been developing. Now, where do we go from here? The next step <coughs> is to, <coughs> well, the next step includes creating all of, or completing all of the work we're working on now, which is uh, there are various processing algorithms for the calibration of the chemo metrics in the presentation that I didn't put into this. It's um, work that's being done primarily by our graduate students. Um, the idea is to be able to take the raw data out of the machine and map it in the field as it's collected, uh, which requires uh, quite a bit of programming. Uh, we need to finish the publication of the second Kansas project, which is in draft form, um, and the, we need to collect the rest of the spectra from the unnamed state, uh, from the Native American burial ground, and complete that work. Once those are done, we then have our proof of concept to go back to NIJ, to go back to NSF and say, look, it works with humans, it works with 200-year-old humans. Now, hopefully, we'll be able to get the money to, to push forward for this. Um, so we'll reapply for our funds. Um, there are a couple of future challenges. Uh, one of the problems with this equipment and its use as a forensic tool is it's mounted on a three-quarter ton pickup truck. <laughs> and you can't drive a three-quarter ton pickup truck across a crime scene, or a lot, across a lot of crime scenes. Uh, so we need to we need to be able to miniaturize it, to make it smaller, to scale it down. And this is a process. And I was I was talking with uh, one of your faculty earlier. For a lot of geo, geophysical or geochemical uh, equipment that's used in archaeology, none of this is developed for archaeology. So uh, the geophysical equipment we use was all built for geology, and we simply scaled it so it's looking out of the deep earth, but at the shallow earth. Um, and here what we need to do is we need to miniaturize this so that it's appropriate to uh, an archaeological uh, or a forensic application. That's an engineering problem. Um, I like the idea of automating it so that it sort of runs around and collects the data on a grid without us having to move, the, move a truck uh, on a, uh, which would greatly speed up the data collection process. Um, the other question, of course, and Many of you will have caught this. Our best results come from the mid-infrared, and yet the machine that we have on the on board is a visible uh, and near-infrared uh, machine. I'm not a spec, uh, uh, an optical physicist, but I'm told that the problem of putting the mid-infrared machine on the truck is the issue with, is an issue with the way that the light is propagated through different types of fiber optics and that it would be very difficult to do in the field. Not impossible necessarily, but it's going to require, some, again, some serious engineering in order to uh, be able to uh, swap out different type of spectrometers. There's a lot of ancillary projects. We also looked at whether we could use Raman spectroscopy, which didn't work. Um, so there, this, again, is very much uh, in, the, in the trial stage. We're still trying to get this to work out. Um, it's involved a lot of people, a lot of time, it's a story without a, a clear answer, but I think we're making very good progress towards what could be pretty transformative to be able to take your geophysical map and detail the chemical and uh, uh, components structures of the interior of these of these um, features 
would be a significant advancement for us in archaeology. So that's, that is the long-term goal, and maybe in 10 years, Lisa will invite me back. Mm -hmm. I can show you the machine. <laughs> the machine. The machine, yes. Right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Questions for Tim? You can only ask questions that I'm capable of answering. <laughs> <laughs> Which may limit them. Yes? So with the pig site, you then you only found those trace chemicals in one of the cores? It was only in the one, uh, the, the C2 core. Uh, we still have some of the samples. We may, may go back and try so it again. Were those off to the side of the pig, on top of the pig? Where, where were they relative? We, we attempted to make the... The pig had been buried, and so we had we knew roughly where the pig was. The first core we thought was at the very, very edge of the actual pig itself, and then each core was taken uh, 20 centimeters out from that. So the second core should have been about 20 centimeters from the pig itself, but you can actually see that white discoloration. If that's adipus here from the pig, then we must have hit the, some part of the pig. Uh, with the core and equipment. I wasn't there for the excavation of it. But it's not above the pig. It's, so what's going on underground in the, the decomposition and moving this stuff around? That's a good question. And we've been talking with the, the folks at the body farm about the what happens to, to decay products underground. And presumably, our under, current understanding is that there's surprisingly little movement of the soil chemistry, which somewhat is, is at odds with what we thought uh, we had in terms of this, the placement of the cores. Uh, one of the projects that we weren't involved with, but which informs the question, uh, is being conducted, it's an ongoing experiment at the uh, Forensic Anthropology Center. And what they've done is they've created a, a burial plot, and they've put a, an actual body in it, because they have access to this. And what they've been doing is they've been measuring nitrogen levels of the grass growing on top relative to the grass growing outside of the grade. Now, this is a totally controlled experiment, so they know exactly where the edges are. And they said that the nitrogen content is greater above the grass, but that it doesn't spread out, that there doesn't appear to be much in the way of leaching to either side. You know, I suspect that we would have to look at different soil conditions. There's probably a lot of factors that are going to play into that. Um, but at least those results suggest that you're not getting goo traveling through the, the soil very far. Um, that's one of these, but that's one of the questions that we really need to, that we'll be able to answer once we've got our mapping technologies down. Is, is so I guess I don't really understand. You actually have to have the, your probe go through the dead body? Um, well, the, in the cases where we're looking for the, the buried remains, there often is very little of the body left. Or where the body was. Where the body was, which is significant. Um, or relatively close, but we, don't, we simply don't know the answer to that. We don't know how far uh, these, these decay products will travel. And presumably there will be different spreads, if you will, for different types of so do you think it's more likely then that number two went through where the pig was? I think it probably there went there is a non-uniform distribution where the pig was of the pig relic. Chemicals. Right. So the, the pig has trotters sticking out. Maybe we got close to you know, a leg or something. I, again, I wasn't there for the for the excavation. Uh, we didn't. Act, this project actually wasn't even conceived of at the time that the pig was excavated. So we didn't. Uh, collect nearly as good a spatial data as we probably could have um, if we had been planning all along to do to do this spectroscopy project there. Um, my guess is it probably came closer to the pig on the second core I see. than the I first core because of yeah. the, the way that the body was was laid out. Again, it was laid out to be forensically interesting. So it's not like one big massive pig. Right. Does that I make sense? I got so I think that's yeah. that's that's probably the best answer I can. Yeah. Um. Oh, this may have some. Oh, I'm sorry. So, two. So you, it seems to be you're talking about 200 year old um, Native American remains, right? Right. Is it? What do you think is the lowest threshold in terms of, of age of you know datable material that you're going to be able to 
how fast do these fatty acids disappear? You know? We know that under the right conditions, they can survive for a couple of centuries in visible form. Uh, there, as far as I know, there's no data that, that allow us to assess going back hundreds or thousands of years. Obviously, to be of interest ultimately to archaeologists, this stuff needs to survive right. um, quite a long time. So for me, if we can get dates back three, four thousand years, that'll be that'll be in the interesting range for me, three, four, five thousand years. Um, but there's just there's no longitudinal data. No one's no one's tried this. Um, so the question of how far does it spread and how old can you how long can you expect this to survive are sort of fundamental questions that we're only going to be able to answer in the current So my next other question is when you scale it down from this big huge thing on the back of the truck, yeah. how, I mean, I've used the resistivity two years before, I've used yeah. the radiometer before, how small can you, do you proceed being able to get this down to? Like a staff? No, well, like, you know, you, you've done enough soil cores, it's difficult to get a core into the, a core or into the ground or probe into the ground very far. Um, it's going to be limited, it's going to be primarily limited by the weight that we'll need. Or the, essentially, they use the truck as ballast, they use it to, as weight oh, in order to push the, to be able to push the probe down. Now, that's partially because the probe is mounting on the end of the truck. If you mounted the probe in the middle of the truck, it would be, it'd be awkward to drive around, but you would use the whole of the truck as the weight rather yeah. than just one end of it. So you could scale it down a bit that way. Uh, also, could you put it on a trailer instead of a truck? You could put it maybe on a, yeah, some sort of a trailer or a rig, and then you could drag it across to where you need it. Um, we could also use a different size probe. The probe was set up for, again, for an industrial scale use. Yeah. A uh, smaller probe would be easier to push into the ground, but again, that depends on moisture. It depends on the nature of the soil itself. So uh, it's going to take some trial and error to figure out how small we can get it. One more question. Sorry. Yeah. What it's going to be a great engineering project. What about NASA? Students. I mean, they have all these rovers. That, you know, the rover technology on Mars goes around and does all kinds of stuff in remote, you right. know, and does chemistry and right. has spectrometers. Yeah. Yeah, Are they one, interested in this sort of technology? Okay, yeah. just one comment uh, uh, along the line. In geocagging engineering, uh, something called a, a CPT, a cone, cone penetrating test, mm -hmm. they do mount it in the middle of the truck. So yeah. they can use the whole weight of the truck to, to do it. So that might be the, the, the advantage you can think about to right. the mount in the, in the center. That, that's some, um, something there, yeah. right. but that's weight. They work on foundations, you know, right. but uh, that's something the possibility mini match, mini miniature, right? And it, it, it's you know it's not far to take it in terms of conception to have a series of probes rather than just one probe mm -hmm. and moving having it move by itself into mm -hmm. into position. Yeah. The the way that the P four thousand is mounted, it's got a little bit of play, so we can actually take two samples at twenty five centimeters without having to move the truck. At the time is moving the truck and getting it into the right place. Yeah. <clears throat> and Chase has been doing this long enough that he can do it quickly, but it takes a lot of extra time to, to just physically move the thing into the correct location. Yeah. So four by four grid, two hundred and seventy different test test probes. Yeah. Something like that. What is the cone of disturbance? It is still probing the ground and you still are disturbing the, the subsurface material. Yeah. What is the diameter? Of, a, of, a, of disturbance, do you think? It's two and a half centimeters is the, is the diameter. Yes, yeah, so it's pretty, it's so it, and it's not, is it pushing material out a lot, or is it, what's the... <laughs> not a lot, at least yeah. in the, you know, from surface observations yeah. at the uh, at the site itself. It's like sticking a needle right in. Yeah. Uh, it's slightly bigger than yeah, a needle. Yeah, I wouldn't want to get a needle in my head. Yeah, I wouldn't want to get, get a shot delivered by this system, but uh, yeah. uh, it's compared to excavation, it's minimally intrusive. It's not, as one of our reviewers pointed out, it is not unintrusive, but it is less intrusive. Right. And some of the practical applications that are of interest are, going back to Lisa's example, the buried body in the field. Where is it? And this, I've had the police and the coroner's office on a number of occasions say, 
we think there's a, a body in this field. Where is it? Now, I wouldn't use this machine first. I'd pull out my gradiometer, yeah. and I'd do, the, do a gradiometry survey and take the anomalies, and then you can test it using yeah. this and maybe get a, a, a good result. Yeah. Um, in which case, yes, two and a half centimeters disturbs the burial, but if that's the best way to find it, yeah. the practicality is that that's, that's what you'll do. Finding the edges of cemeteries. I've got several cemetery projects going on in Akron right now, where mm -hmm. historic cemeteries where people have lost their gravestones. They want to know the edges so they can put a fence around them. Yeah. Where do the burials stop? And we can find pits sometimes, but can we say that there's a body in there? Are we certain that there are the grave pits? That's, again, the kind of detailed characterization that we're hoping to be able to make with this group. Any so, other questions? Any other well, again, questions? I invite everybody over to our house for a sort of pre-Thanksgiving or festival of sorts. Um, beer. That's a curl. Pumpkin pie. Oh, pumpkin pie, apple cake, all kinds of things. If you want to bring anything, maybe um, bring a salad or something. Aside. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>